Welcome to Texas 2036's virtual series, Straight Talk Texas, where you have a front row seat to conversations on topics important to our future. My name is Enisha Shropshire, Director of Board and External Affairs here at Texas 2036. Joining us today is Dr. LaTanya Goffney, Superintendent of Aldine ISD in Houston. Since taking the helm in 2018, Dr. Goffney has been a leader of new initiatives for Aldine ISD's 67,000 students and 9,000 employees. These initiatives include pilot pre-K, dual language immersion, and college readiness programs. Because of her leadership, Dr. Goffney served on the education part of a working group with the Greater Houston Partnership to develop a plan to reopen Houston safely as the city dealt with the coronavirus pandemic. She previously served as superintendent of Cold Spring Oakhurst Consolidated ISD and Lufkin ISD. She was named superintendent of the year in 2017. Dr. Goffney will spend today talking with Texas 2036 president and CEO and former secretary of education under the Bush administration, Margaret Spellings, about Aldine ISD's response to the COVID-19 pandemic and her work with teachers and leaders to reimagine how the district will reopen for the return of students. Margaret? Thank you, Anisha. I appreciate that. And Latanya, Dr. Goffney, <laughs> fantastic to be here with you. And I wanted Anisha to say all that stuff because you are such a leader and you've had such a breadth of experience uh, in our state. And I think really a good bird's eye view. Uh, surely people are seeing how important our public schools are to the fabric of life, to working families, to businesses operating and whatnot. And that is fragile at the moment, as you know. And so it's taking a lot of creativity and incredible leadership. Uh, you are, if anything, a, a, a true leader. And you know uh, that desperate times really require us to step into the breach. So thank you for your service. And I'm gonna dive right in and, and ask you, uh, how's it going down there? What are you doing? How are you making lemonade from the lemons that we have before us? and above all, serving your students and families. Well, thank you, um, Dr. Margaret Spelling. I'm so honored to be here with you. I'm kind of trying not to, <laughs> not to like fan out because I've been a huge fan of yours for many years, but uh, I appreciate the, the, the kudos. The irony about all of this is when it first start, started, uh, March 6th is when it really got real in Aldine. And I remember Mark six for several reasons, but one of the reasons is because we had a, a significant scare. We had a student with an elevated fever. Uh, mm -hmm. had, his parents had recently traveled uh, to China and it was 2.20. And we had to decide on the Friday, right before spring break, what were we gonna do about it? Wow. And that moment changed everything. And so when you said leadership matters, very excited, very pleased, very thankful for the leadership team that we have because instead of traveling, of course, during spring break, we were thinking about reimagining and wondering how are we going to be able to uh, keep our students and our faculty safe while also meeting the needs, the academic needs of our, our students. So uh, I'm blessed because we do have a good team because uh, if it wasn't for good leadership, this would be hard work. I mean, mm -hmm. people lead in general, but during crisis is when we need really good leaders. And I'm very exactly. fortunate to have great leadership. So how are you thinking about, uh, you know, tell me about how it's going online and, uh, you know, how how many kids are, do you have that have not been accounted for or have issues with technology and broadband? I think often people think, well, Aldine, they're in the big fat middle of a major urban area and mm -hmm. broadband is no issue down there. And yet we know that affordability and access truly is. So talk a little bit about that. Uh, it <laughs> Like I said initially, just very pleased with the way our team has been able to respond because, you know, like overnight in a matter of a couple of days, we had to stand up a, an online learning platform. And meanwhile, while standing it up, by, while doing the work, we wondered, okay, would our students be able to access it? And so we had conversations around the fact that we wanted everything that we did to be able to be completed on a, a cell phone because we realize that a lot of parents, a lot of people have cell phones. Right. And so while that is important, we also have to understand who wants to type a page or a paper or anything on a, on a cell phone, but at least that's something to start. And mm -hmm. so uh, we, uh, it was important for us to know how many students could actually access uh, information if we were to put it on an online platform. And uh, so we launched what we called All Dean Cares, where we had every single teacher contact our students. And we were able to contact about 73% of our students and then initially, and we've gotten to more, like 95%. But what we found in the original piece is that it was astounding. 40% of our students did not have access 
to a cell phone or any type of ability mm -hmm. to access broadband access. And that was shocking. And yeah. so you might think, OK, we can handle devices because we ordered devices. We were able to round up all the devices in our district to make sure that our students had Chromebooks and so on and so forth. And we were able to order hotspots, even though everyone was ordering them. So in addition to the challenge of just handing out a hotspot, what surprised us was the dead areas in Aldine, in urban Aldine, which is in Houston, Texas. Exactly. I have lived in Lufkin. I lived in Lead in Cold Spring. And, you know, you think in rural areas, there are dead zones. But imagine the fact that in Houston, Texas, there are yep. dead zones. And so we're trying to work through those challenges right now as well. Yes. And in fact, uh, in our strategic framework for Texas 2036, you know, we have four cities that are the worst connected mm -hmm. in the nation in our in our state. And uh, we really have to go to work on that. So this is obviously made for major changes of our educators, our, our, our leaders like you, but but clearly our classroom teachers who were thrown in often to this, uh, you know, baptism by fire, if you will. Talk about how how we're deploying human capital in smart ways, thinking about teachers as coaches and mentors and and as well as instructors, uh, the role of parents. Just what's the implications for our educators? Well, you know, uh, as I, uh, I'm very pleased in general, because if you told me um, uh, prior to spring break that we were going to be able to do this, I'd have thought that we'd had to deploy a design team, a project manager and everyone else. <laughs> <Yeah>. but, <laughs> and, you know, and they would have told me a million reasons why we couldn't do it. The students can't have and cannot be trusted to take care of a Chrome yeah, exactly. to get this sign or that sign. And so um, the important thing for us initially, though, instead of just in addition to standing up the website, we had to get our teachers trained. Mm -hmm. Although we had a platform, Schoology, it was uh, utilized at will. Like, Teachers used it or they didn't. It wasn't anything that was uh, mandated or expected. And so we had a few teachers who were choosing to use it and a few who weren't. And consequently, that uh, the first week or so as we were uh, transitioning and extending spring break, we were busy training teachers and our teachers met and um, met the demand. We had 100 percent of our teachers on 100 percent of our campuses who completed our training and went through how do we create lessons on Schoology? How do we create meaningful lessons, not busy work? We right. did not want this to be about uh, just putting lessons out, out there. We really wanted it to be a continuation the best way that we could of what our, our, our teachers were doing in the classrooms. And so, uh, so the first ch challenge was utilizing our instructional coaches and getting our teachers trained up. And what has been amazing is the fact that it's gone so well. The teachers who probably would have been the most opposed in, at, the, at the beginning have been more welcoming and, and embracing this new learning. And they you can tell, you can tell uh, qualitatively, and I know we, we may get to it, but how do we uh, identify and determine what is the effectiveness of those teachers? Exactly. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's go there next before we start talking about the coming school year. So we we read a lot about learning loss. We surely do know that's that's gonna gonna occur. And you know, how do we think about assessment and accountability and progress monitoring uh, without throwing everything overboard and saying, you know, we give up? You know, it strikes me that the same people who are running around saying we need more testing when it comes to COVID are often the same people who are saying no more tests. Exactly. Exactly. So anyway, it's hard to find, solve problems that we don't identify. Mm -hmm. And that's particularly true for our for our struggling learners. So speak about that, Latonya. I know you've been a leader here. Yeah. And perhaps that's what keeps me awake at night. You know, we started the year excited. We just launched a new strategic plan. We have five strategic priorities. Uh, we were excited about what House Bill 3 was going to provide for a district like ours with 89 percent low socioeconomic students who come from low socioeconomic homes. And, uh, and I tell you, we've done a phenomenal job of uh, carrying it through and we've been able to complete universal screeners in mid-year and we've been able to see the difference that our teachers have made. And so to have to pivot and not have any data other than um, what we were hoping and seeing through our Schoology dashboard mm -hmm. has been um, um, a huge challenge because how do we measure the success that we know we had, that we know we did, and then re recognizing that there is going to be some loss because of not only COVID-19, but also the summer loss that's natural and so on and so forth. And right. so um, how do we not lose this whole year? And um, and then how do we assess where we are? And that's a conversation we just had with our, our team looking at, you know, we know that 
the star assessment is not here. We recognize and, you know, uh, they said that early and I understand the rationale. It would be hard to assess and give a star assessment during these times. But, you know, assessing is a part of learning. And if we have remote learning, then how are we assessing to make sure that our students are learning and our teachers are teaching? Because assessment is twofold, too. Not only do we assess whether or not our students are learning, but what types of supports? Remember, I just, I just said that we basically trained our teachers in a matter of a couple of days to be able to do this work that we've been expecting them to do for the last eight weeks. So how do we even assess whether or not we're making a meaningful difference? Because otherwise we are spending lots of money. We're not being as efficient as we possibly can. What I can tell you is during these initial conversations is uh, we're trying to right at this moment. I know uh, TEA has rolled out uh, some tests that are optional and we're looking at how can we assess where our students are right now, even though we know it's going to be bad data because, yeah. you know, um, parents may assist and parents may do different things or whatever. But if we see it as a true partnership, which is one benefit of this whole crisis, I think more than anything, our parents understand the challenges that our teachers have, have been on. And also because a lot of the conversations have truly been about partnering. So it's not we're going to assess, we're going to give you a test because it's the, the mean thing to do. It's a punitive thing. Right. It's just how can we best meet the needs of your students? And the only way we can do that is if we have some data, some baseline data on where we are. And so we're partnering with our parents to say we want to assess and see the difference that this opportunity is made. And we recognize that every student won't be able to take it, but hopefully we'll have a large enough sample size that we can make some decisions as we're planning our summer learning experiences. And then it, when we come back, be able to do the same thing uh, at the beginning of the year, however we come back and be able to assess and move on. Because otherwise um, we're just playing school and we exactly. don't want to be <laughs> playing exactly. school and it's not making a meaningful difference. Because what you know is the pandemic, COVID-19, coronavirus, whatever you want to call it, before it was here, we had these problems that have now become on the national scene, uh, whether it's a digital divide, whether it's lack of reading ability or whatever. So what are we going to do about it? We can't allow this to become a new excuse for why we have low expectations and low output. Exactly. And I think I completely agree with you that, that parents are discovering that little precious might not be as gifted as they mm -hmm. thought and that educating students is a real challenging. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so to continue quickly on assessment, and then we'll talk about the opening of the school year. I mean, there's really two things we can do. One is we can embed ongoing progress monitoring in this in these technological platforms. But what would you think about, I mean, should the STAR test be given early in the, in the new year as a diagnostic, low stakes, where are we instrument or, you know, what are some options? You know, um, Ideally, what I would uh, literally like to see, but I know um, it's not going to be popular. We've got to figure out how to have some type of baseline assessment. I understand why we canceled it this year. Sure. There's going to be some type of baseline diagnostic assessment for this upcoming year. Otherwise, we really are going to be measuring uh, zip code and poverty and all of those different things. Exactly. And so how do we know who's added value through their online learning experience or through our blended learning or uh, whatever we're going to do as we're coming back, how are we going to know and how we're going to measure what was lost and how we're going to be able to to move yes, forward? Sure. Exactly. So, so let's change channels to starting of the school year. Um, you know, are you a fan of summer school or should we make the school year longer? How are you thinking about using space? How are you thinking about deploying your teachers, many of whom may be at risk themselves or over mm -hmm. 65 or what? You know, all the various challenges. What is your game plan for the 20? 21 school year. We are considering everything. Oh, one. <laughs> we are considering everything because, um, you know, what I've learned is the sooner we make a decision, then we get more information and then that decision is out. So we're planning for short term, long term. We have um, very excited about looking at our calendar. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Immediately when um, everyone was uh, basically standing up the website and looking, like, looking at what we're going to do right now, a couple of colleagues and I were talking about, you know, this is scary for districts like ours. Yeah. You know, uh, I know there are some colleagues who are very fortunate. They work in uh, districts in which, you know, that at home learning experience is, is as positive and as ideal and model as it could possibly be. And then you have some who work in um, our, our students who are whose parents who are, are working hard and, and, and thinking about, you know, where they're going to be able to get their next meals and different food and may not have the comfort that are a lot of my colleagues works in, in districts of that magnitude. So I was talking to a colleague and we in, immediately 
said, we're going to have to look at how our calendar is, because the best way to address some of the issues that we've lost, the learning loss, is through extending the calendar, extending the school day, looking at how we bring our students in, looking at how we group our students and so on and so forth. So we are um, we have a task force and we're in the process of looking at what our secondary students look like. Elementary, we're looking at looping uh, our teachers. So at least it's a, it's a teacher that many of the students have already had. And so and, and building on that. And I think some of the best you know, investments our state can make is extending the time for our learners. That is going to be very valuable. So House Bill 3, obviously huge, major, progressive reform. Mm-hmm. Uh, with lots of elements, and I know you're excited about implementing all of that. Wow, you know, we're in a stop, look, and listen again. So what do you see as those most essential pieces that we should all go link arms and 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 make the case to our legislature that we've got to have those investments? Well, I certainly hope that the basic allotment is not touched. I mean, yeah. I remember it hadn't been touched in many years, and so yeah. when you start playing around with that, it gets complicated, and the the, the where a kid in Aldine is worth less than a kid in um, Cold Spring or Lufkin or any other places that I've worked. And then understanding that there are challenges. For the first time, we had school finance that looked at equity, that looked at the fact that there are certain kids who require more resources in order to uh, to move forward. It's not that our students can't learn. It's just that we need more resources. As we look at our bilingual population and that bilingual allotment, that was a benefit for a district like Aldine. Uh, there's there's uh, still the concern with uh, attracting and retaining our bilingual teachers. And so there's additional resources that are needed with that regard. In addition, looking at our dyslexics, our students who are in dis- receive dyslexic services and so on and so forth. And so there was a benefit uh, for sure that we were looking for the manifestation of, yeah. of Bill 3. And then, of course, the other three uh, uh, buckets that were uh, exciting, you know, CCMR and outcome based mm-hmm. funding. Think yeah. about that. That was going to change. You know, we say all the time we want our students to graduate with more than a high school diploma. We want them to graduate with choices and opportunities. What better way than through our CCMR funding? And then all of the others, uh, our TIA, as far as um, making sure that we can pay teachers uh, up to six figures, that was exciting. Yeah. And then, of course, the extended calendar, which we know more than ever is needed right now. So I think all the needs that House Bill 3 attempted to address, they're going to become even more exasperated. Yeah. in post-pandemic than even prior to it even happening. So I hope that there's some consideration taken for that. Because many times, like in 2011, they slashed uh, funding, and, uh, and understandably so, to meet a need. But there are some implications of that years later. Well, and we saw our school <laughs> retreat, especially, especially in reading. And Absolutely. you and I share a, a passion for that. And, you know, it's something that we at Texas 2036 are paying attention to third grade reading, fourth grade reading on the NAEP. And obviously this is your mission, but your, you know, your, your results and all Dean, you know, lag the state average and, you know, literacy, literacy, literacy. So talk about that. Uh, and how you're addressing those issues, especially now. So coming into the district two years ago, and just to kind of frame it, um, I, my my grandfather, he couldn't read and he couldn't write. He actually wrote his name with an X. And he used to tell me, he would say, um, uh, LaTanya or Tanya, if you can read, you can go anywhere. And we know that to be true. Not literally. I mean, I still get lost. <laughs> no, but you but yes, have, yeah. Yeah. True. And yeah. I, at an early age, we didn't have a lot of resources, but I had a lot of books and I lo- had a, grew up with a love of reading. And so one of the most um, uh, the best opportunity as a, as a superintendent of the, our district is looking at, you know, third grade reading. You know, it's a um, it becomes a cliche. And, you know, you have legislators and others who say it, say it, we want students reading on grade level by third grade. Right. We want students reading on grade level by third grade. What we got to do Why, it. What are we going to do? Exactly. And so if we think about yeah. you know, 28 percent in all day. Yeah. Coming in 28 percent. And so uh, I do a thing with one of reading teachers and all the teachers. And I say one, two, three. OK, you can't read one. You can read. You can't read. And so right. who wants to be the one to not be able to read? Who wants their child to not be able to read? So that is the gift. I mean, I think that is the civil right of our time to make sure our mm-hmm. students can read. And I also believe that, that there's a there's a path forward. We just got to look at and that's what we've done. We took a whole year. We didn't adopt book textbooks. We didn't do anything. We have truly taken this very serious. When I came in, there was a very popular uh, program. But when you looked at the results, the exactly. program would meet the needs of the students. Exactly. And we have some adults who love the program. Right. Love it. 
And but we have to come to a place where we love our kids more than we love programs and people and say, OK, what are we going to do in order to make sure that our students leave us, leave third grade, reading on third grade. But more importantly, you talked about House Bill 3 funding. You know, it says that we are piloted pre-K. We piloted pre-K three. I want the students as soon as possible. We have a, yeah. a strong pre-K four program. So we want our students leaving pre-K three, pre-K four and entering kindergarten ready and then get it, uh, rising first graders to enter first grade ready to learn. And so anyway, long story short, I um, I can't speak enough on the importance of reading. I'm very proud of work and it can't wait. Like exactly. uh, <laughs> it can't wait. Like we're in the middle of preparing for um the you know the pandemic and what COVID nineteen is going to mean moving forward, but COVID nineteen has just made our work more urgent as it relates to our reading plans, and so we're really excited about how we're rolling rolling out and reimagining how we teach reading. You know, you just have infectious enthusiasm for your work, and it really comes through every time you communicate with anyone. And and I, you know, I just want you to reflect for just one second about those expectations we have for our kids. I mean, this kind of no excuses, by God, we got to do it. And I, you know, this, we've got to just challenge this, you know, some kids can't kind of thing. And and I can really feel that in you, LaTanya. So talk for a second about that and that'll be our final word. Think about it. I mean, uh, and I recognize, and we're, while building out our uh, learning plans and moving forward and, and, and improving expectations, I recognize the last place as a student during this time, if I were a student, I would have wanted to be was at home. I recognize that, you know, there was a lot of mental illness and a lot of different things. And of course, we've got to make preparation to meet our students' emotional needs. And I I get I, I get that. So and I recognize that eating is important. You know, we do the best clothes drives. We are fervent about how we uh, do food drives. We do all these other things to make sure and take care of the social piece. But we don't get as angry and as focused about taking action on making sure that our students can read so that we can change the trajectories of their futures. And so the problem many times is we feel sorry for poor mm -hmm. kids. We feel sorry for black and brown kids. And we don't do the work because it's different and because it's hard. We do the social piece. Anybody will donate money for a food drive. Anybody will donate clothes for yep, a food drive. Exactly. But what are we going to do to make sure that our students can read? And so uh, I think and I hope that um, this pandemic experience will uh, shine a light on the inequities, of course, but not make it an excuse for low expectations and for low uh, student outcomes. Amen. Amen. No child left behind. <laughs> <laughs> Emita, back to you, my friend. Thank you all for watching Straight Talk Texas. If you have questions and feedback, we want to hear from you. Email us at straighttalk at texas2036.org and follow us on social media and sign up to receive our emails. Visit texas2036.org for more information. Until next time, wishing you and your family well.